Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Laura Henriksen. I'm the Director of Learning and Community Engagement at the Poetry Project, and I am so grateful and excited to be here with you all tonight and to be here with the totally astonishing Karen Barad. Before we get started, though, I have just a couple reminders and updates. Um, first thing is that our wonderful moderator for tonight, Anna Kreinenberg, is going to add to the chat now a link to some helpful Zoom tips. I do want to make a note that we are recording tonight's event. So you're welcome to have your cameras on or off as you prefer, but it's just something to keep in mind that your face might flicker onto the recording. Um, and also, if uh, I want to point out in the upper left corner, you'll see that live on custom live streaming service option. So if you click on that um, and start view live stream, that'll bring you to a live transcript of tonight's event in another browser window. Cool. Um, I also want to note Anna is now adding to the chat as well um, a link to our statement of safer spaces. Whether or not whether the space we share is virtual or physical, we remain to commit. We remain committed to building with you all an environment that challenges and resists ongoing structures of hierarchy and harm. And we are really grateful to you all for joining us in that work. If this event were taking place as we originally envisioned it so long ago in the spring of 2020, we would be gathered together now in St. Mark's Church in the Bowery in a church built over the site where Peter Stuyvesant built his family chapel in 1660. Peter Stuyvesant enslaved 40 people and in his time as director general of New Netherlands increased the enslaved population in the colony whose stolen lives and labor were used to construct the buildings and streets on this stolen land. St. Mark's Church is located on the unceded homeland of the Lenape people, Lenape Ho King. I am speaking to you tonight from what is called Sunset Park in Brooklyn, which is on the unceded homeland of the Canarsie people, a Muncie speaking band of Lenape people. A neighborhood whose waterfront was redlined in the 1930s, a waterfront that is now the site of municipal detention center, a federal prison where 1600 people are currently experiencing incarceration. Anna is putting uh, a map in the chat now, not to endorse it as complete, but to invite you all to continually learn about the land that you occupy and its histories and ties. As we gather across various neighborhoods and states, it gives me occasion to remember that it's not just some of the land that was stolen or some of the land that needs to be returned, but all of it. It reminds me too that to return the land is not a matter of transferring capitalist ownership, but as many indigenous thinkers have explained, a radical rethinking of belonging and ownership centering indigenous autonomy and active relationality and responsibility. To reiterate Gloria Anzaldúa's assertion, this land was Lenape hoking always and is and will be again. I'm gonna keep my introduction to Karen brief to leave as much time as possible for the Q&A at the end because I know that I have a lot of questions I'm excited to ask and also I'm sure that you all do too. So I wanna invite you throughout the course of the, tonight's event, as those questions occur to you, um, chat them directly to Roberto, who you'll notice has Q&A after his name, and we'll be collecting those and get to as many as we can at the end. I remember the first time I read Karen Barad's work so vividly. I was in the waiting room of a doctor's office next to a decorative fish tank, and my heart started racing like my crush had unexpectedly arrived, which in a sense is what happened but my crush was now on perverse electrons and their mysterious virtual photon partners. It was on the cacophonous abundance of the void and all its playful indeterminacies. And then it was also a crush on myself too, for not being myself anymore, but part of this vastness, threaded and threading through this alterity already within. In the moment of coming to this work, I felt and I saw something I recognized as free, in ways unlike I had ever previously imagined. Barad teaches us that, quote, all matter is in its essence, a massive overlaying of perversities an infinity of infinities. And the void is not empty and particles are not separable from it, end quote. That was actually a string of quotes I put together. I don't want that to be misleading. 
These lessons are not abstractions, removed like a distant theorist from the material realm, because there is no remove and there is no distancing possible here, no clear division between the scientific and effective. We are in it and it is in us, all that trouble and all these ghosts. Touching is always consequential. And the consequences of this touch of infinite indeterminacies are enormous, although perhaps enormous is the wrong word, as the notion of scale, of measurability, and computability is here a question too. Barad writes, quote, even the smallest bits of matter are an unfathomable multitude, and, quote, a cacophony of whispered screams, gasps, and cries, an infinite multitude of indeterminate beings diffracted through different space times, the nothingness is always already within us, or rather it lives through us. We cannot block out the irrationality, the perversity, the madness we fear in the hopes of a more orderly world. But this does not mitigate our responsibility. On the contrary, it is what makes it possible." End quote. I'm thinking about all of this in a poisoned nation, blustering and teetering, toxic and blood-soaked, and it is clear that this matter matters a lot for all our intricate anarchic relationality, all justice to come. It is my great honor now to turn it over to Karen Barad. Hopefully I've unmuted myself. Okay, thank you so much, Laura. Um, and thank you, for, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Very, very generous. I wanna also begin by acknowledging that I'm giving this talk on the unceded territory of the Coast Miwok peoples. And I wanna thank them and their ancestors for their ongoing care of the land. I also wanna extend my gratitude to Laura and her team at the Poetry Pro Project, to Roberto and Anna and Matt. Uh, and in some ways is a, a thank you squared because of the fact that uh, we were getting ready to go uh, last March when uh, travel stopped, when travel was stopping. So thank you so much for uh, all the work that everybody put into this, not once, but twice uh, to make this happen. And I also wanna thank, um, well, I also, first of all, wanna say that I'm delighted to hear of your crush on electrons. I'm also crushed out on electrons, of course, and thankfully they're anything but uh, monogamous. So, uh, uh, so anyway, I want to thank everybody who's attending today. I know that we're all zoomed out in so many ways. The uh, possibilities for being in touch in some ways have been extended and in other ways we're in touch in ways that uh, feel flattened and uh, not, uh, does, do not give us a certain kind of uh, tactility or other kinds of sensuality and ways of making sense that we might be used to in attending talks. I know that I'm really longing for uh, what we would have had in New York City. Um, and, uh, you know, because giving a talk really is always already about response and responsiveness. I'm so used to engaging with the people that I'm talking to according to the expressions on their faces and uh, other ways in which you really get energy from as you're giving it uh, back in a, in a certain kind of very, you know, an exchange that is all about responses and, and touching. So I'm really touched that you're here. I really uh, very much appreciate it. And uh, with that, maybe I'll put up my uh, PowerPoint and uh, Actually, it's not PowerPoint, it's Prezi, and begin my talk, so. Darn, I meant to, uh, Okay, I'm not gonna be staring at you. So if you wanna stare at me, that's okay, but it'll be a little funny. I'll be reading my text. <laughs> anyway, um, the title of my talk tonight is On Touching the Stranger Within, The Alterity That Therefore I Am. When two hands touch, there is a sensuality of the flesh, an exchange of warmth, 
a feeling of pressure, of presence, a proximity of otherness that brings the other nearly as close as oneself, perhaps closer. And if two hands belong to one person, might this not enliven an uncanny sense of the otherness of the self, a literal holding oneself at a distance in the sensation of contact, the greeting of the stranger within. So much happens in a touch, an infinity of others, other beings, other spaces, other times are aroused. When two touch, hands touch, how close are they? What is the measure of closeness? Which disciplinary knowledge formations, political parties, religious and cultural traditions, infectious disease authorities, immigration officials, and policymakers do not have a stake in, if not a measured answer to this question. When touch is at issue, nearly everyone's hair stands on end. I can barely touch on even a few aspects of touch here, at most offering the barest suggestion of what it might mean to approach, to dare to come into contact with this infinite finitude. Many voices speak here in the interstices, a cacophony of always already reiteratively interacting stories. These are entangled tales. Each is diffractively threaded through and enfolded in the other. Is that not in the nature of touching? Is touching not by its very nature always already an involution, invitation, invisitation, wanted or unwanted of the stranger within. It's called Electric Fields and Yearnings, Attraction and Repulsion, Touching on Touch. Touch for a physicist is but an electromagnetic interaction. A common explanation for the physics of touching is that one thing it does not involve is, well, touching. That is, there is no actual contact involved. You may think you are touching a coffee mug when you're about to raise it to your mouth, but your hand is not actually touching the mug. Sure, you can feel the smooth surface of the mug's exterior right where your fingers come into contact with it or seem to, but what you are actually sensing is the electromagnetic repulsion between the electrons of the atoms that make up your fingers and those that make up the mug. Electrons are tiny negatively charged particles that surround the nuclei of atoms and having the same charges that repel one another, much like powerful little magnets. As you decrease the distance between them, the repulsive force increases. Try as you might, you cannot bring two electrons into direct contact with each other. The reason the desk feels solid or the cat's coat feels soft or we can even hold coffee cups in one another's hands is an effect of electromagnetic repulsion. All we ever really feel is the electromagnetic force, not the other whose touch we seek. Atoms are mostly empty space and electrons which lie at the farthest reaches of an atom hinting at its perimeter cannot bear direct contact. Electromagnetic repulsion, negatively charged particles communicating at a distance push each other away. That is the tale physics usually tells about touching, repulsion at the core of attraction. See how far that story gets you with lovers. No wonder the romantic poets had had enough. The quantum theory of touching is radically different from the classical explanation. Actually, it is radically queer as we shall see. This next section is called Quantum field theory, a virtual introduction. Quantum field theory allows for some radically, something radically new in the history of Western physics, the transience of matter's existence. No longer suspended in eternity, matter is born, lives, and dies. But even more than that, there is a radical deconstruction of identity and of the equation of matter with essence in ways that transcend even the profound unslash doings of non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And I've forgotten to say something about the slash and all the excitement here. Uh, when I use a slash, I don't use it in the usual, the conventional way 
of a kind of either or. For me, it represents the cutting together apart that is an interaction. So undoings, unslash doing. So quantum field theory is a call, an alluring murmur from the insensible within the sensible to radically re rework the nature of being and time. The insights of quantum field theory are crucial, but the philosophical terrain is rugged, slippery, and mostly unexplored. And the question is how to proceed with exquisite care. We will need to be in and of the science, no way around it. Unfortunately, in the limited space time I have here, I can only lightly touch, really just barely graze the surface. Quantum field theory differs from, class of, from classical physics, not only in its formalism, but in its ontology. Classical physics inherits a Democritan ontology, only particles in the void with one additional element, fields. Particles, fields, and the void are three separate elements in classical physics, whereas they are intra-related, indeed co-constitutive elements in quantum field theory. For one thing, there is a correspondence. Oh, I'm having that problem again. Ah, and I don't see the uh, possibility of, ah, there we go. I can operate it this way, okay. So for one thing, there is a correspondence between particles and fields. In particular, particles are quanta of the corresponding fields. For example, what in Newtonian physics is an external force, such as the electromagnetic force or the gravitational force is rethought in terms of fields, the electromagnetic field and the gravitational field respectively. In quantum field theory, the particle or quantum of the electromagnetic field is a photon. The quantum of a gravitational field is a graviton. And furthermore, things we normally think of as particles are quanta of their respective fields. For example, the electron is a quantum of the electron field and so on. Another feature is that the void is far from vacuous. And something very profound happens to the relationship between particles and the void. I will continue to explain how this relationship is radically rethought in what follows. For now, I simply note pace democritus, that particles no longer take their place in the void. Rather, they are constitutively entangled with it. Let's begin with the question of the void. Nothingness the absence of matter, the blank page, utter silence. No thing, no thought, no awareness, complete ontological insensibility. Shall we utter some words about nothingness? What is there to say? How to begin? How can anything be said about nothing without violating its very nature, perhaps even its conditions of possibility? Isn't any utterance about nothingness always already a performative breach of that which one means to address? Have we not already said too much simply in pronouncing its name? Classically speaking, the void is that which is devoid of matter, that which literally doesn't matter. And I'll just note parenthetically here, this is one of the reasons why it has been a very useful tool for colonialism, which we can talk about. When it comes to the quantum vacuum, as with all quantum phenomena, ontological indeterminacy, not epistemological uncertainty, is at the heart of the matter and no matter. Indeed, is it not rather the very existence, the very nature of existence that is at issue, or rather non-existence, or rather the conditions, conditions of im slash possibilities for non slash existence? Or maybe that's the very question the vacuum keeps asking itself. Maybe the ongoing questioning of itself is what generates, or rather is, the structure of nothingness. The vacuum is no doubt doing its own experiments with non slash being in slash determinacy 
is not the state of a thing, but an unending dynamism. The play of in slash determinacy accounts for the unslash doings of no slash thingness. From the point of view of classical physics, the vacuum has no matter and no energy, but the quantum principle of ontological indeterminacy calls the existence of such a zero energy, zero matter state into question, or rather makes it into a question with no decidable answer. Not a settled matter, or rather no matter. And if the energy of the vacuum is not determinately zero, it isn't determinately empty. In fact, this indeterminacy principle is responsible not only for the void not being nothing, while well, not being something, but it may in fact be the source of all that is, a womb that births existence, says one physicist. Birth and death are not the sole prerogatives of the animate world. Inanimate beings also have finite lives. Quote, particles can be born and particles can die, explains one physicist. In fact, it is a matter of birth, life, and death that requires the development of a new subject in physics, that of quantum field theory. Quantum field theory is a response to the ephemeral nature of life, end of quote. According to quantum field theory, the vacuum can't be determinately nothing because the indeterminacy principle allows for fluctuations of the quantum vacuum. That is, some kind of changes of the state of nothingness. How can we understand vacuum fluctuations? Let's consider a very simple example of a field, an infinite drum head. If the drum head is not vibrating, then it is completely flat and has the same value everywhere. Let's call this the zero value corresponding to no displacement. If a drummer now taps the drum head, it vibrates and waves of energy flow outwards from where it is tapped. Thus far, we have a classical field theory with a perfectly still drum head representing the classical vacuum or zero energy state and a vibrating drum head representing a non-zero energy state. Now we add quantum physics. Quantizing the field means that only certain discrete vibrational states exist. If you're not used to thinking about the vibrational modes of the drum, it might be easier to visualize a stringed instrument with only a discrete set of standing waves or harmonics possible. Now we add special relativity, in particular, the insight that matter and energy are equivalent, E equals MC squared, my only equation in the talk. Since vibrations of the field carry energy and only a discrete set of energy states can exist, and a mass value can be assigned to each energy state, then we can see that a field vibrating at a particular frequency or energy is equivalent to the existence of particles of matter with a particular mass. This correspondence between particles, quantum particles and quantized fields is the cornerstone of quantum field theory. Now, let's return to our question. What is a vacuum fluctuation? Using the drum example, the quantum vacuum would correspond to a state where the average value of the displacement is zero everywhere. That is, there's no drummer tapping the drum. And yet the stillness of the drum head is not assured, or rather, there is no determinate fact of the matter as to whether or not the drum head is perfectly still, even in the absence of all external disturbances, including drumming. The vacuum is a speaking silence, a quiet cacophony of different frequencies, pitches, tempos, melodies, noises, pentatonic scales, cries, blasts, sirens, sighs, syncopations, quarter tones, allegros, ragas, bebop, hip hops, whispers, whines, screams are threaded through the silence, ready to erupt, but simultaneously cross cut by a disruption, dissipating, dispersing the would be sound into nine slash being, an indeterminate 
symphony of voices. In other words, vacuum fluctuations are the indeterminate vibrations of the vacuum or zero energy state. Putting this point in the complementary language of particles rather than fields, we can understand vacuum fluctuations in terms of the existence of virtual particles. Virtual particles are quanta of the vacuum fluctuations. That is, virtual particles are quantized indeterminacies in action. The vacuum is an animate dynamism of the indeterminacy of non slash being. It is a no slash thingness, neither nothing nor something. The vacuum is an excitedly exuberant exploration of virtuality, where virtual particles whose identifying characteristic is indeterminacy are having a field day performing experiments in being and time. That is, virtuality is a kind of thought experiment the world performs. Virtual particles do not traffic in a metaphysics of presence. They do not exist in space and time. They are ghostly non slash existences that teeter on the edge of the infinitely fine blade between being and non being. Admittedly, virtuality is difficult to grasp. Indeed, this is its very nature. The next section is called quantum field theory, a touchy subject. When it comes to quantum field theory, it is not difficult to find trouble epistemological trouble, ontological trouble, a troubling of kinds, of identities, of the nature of touching and self-touching, of being and time, to name a few. It's not so much that trouble is around every corner. According to quantum field theory, it inhabits us and we inhabit it. Or rather, trouble inhabits everything and nothing, matter and the void. How does quantum field theory understand the nature of matter? Let us start with the electron, one of the simplest particles, a point particle, a particle devoid of structure. The top diagram with the arrow on the line shows an electron just hanging out as time goes by. Even the simplest bit of matter now causes all kinds of difficulties for quantum field theory. For as a result of time being indeterminacy, the electron does not exist as an isolated particle, but is always already inseparable from the wild activities of the vacuum. In other words, the electron is always already interacting with the virtual particles of the vacuum in all possible ways. For the ex example, the electron will emit a virtual photon, that squiggly blue line in the middle diagram, and then reabsorb it. This possibility is understood as the electron electromagnetically interacting with itself. The part of what an electron is, is its self-energy interaction. But the self-energy interaction is not a process that happens in isolation either. All kinds of more involved things can and do occur in this frothy virtual soup of indeterminacy that we ironically think of as a state of pure emptiness. So now if you'll focus your attention on the bottom diagrams, and there's an infinite number of them, that's what the ellipse is doing there. So for example, in addition to electron exchanging a virtual photon with itself, that is touching itself, it is possible for the virtual photon, the blue squiggly line, to enjoy other interactions with itself. For example, the virtual photon can metamorphose or transition, change its very identity it can transform into a virtual electron positron pair that subsequently annihilate each other and morph back into a single virtual photon before it is reabsorbed by the electron. So that would be the, the pink circle there. And by the way, a positron is the electron's antiparticle. It has the same mass, but the opposite charge is the electron and goes backwards in time an expression of the fact that even the very direction of time is indeterminate. And then we come to the ellipses in the diagram, a uh, so on. And this and so on is a shorthand for an infinite set of possibilities involving every possible kind of interaction 
with every possible kind of virtual particle and it can interact with. That is, there is a virtual exploration of every possibility. And this infinite set of possibilities or infinite sum of histories entails a particle touching itself and the particle that transmits the touch touching itself and then that touching, touching itself and transforming and touching other particles that make up the vacuum and so on ad infinitum. Not everything is possible given a particular interaction, but an infinite number of possibilities exist. Every level of touch then is itself touched by all possible others. Particle self interactions entail particle transitions from one kind to another in a radical undoing of kinds, queer, we might say, transformations. Hence, self-touching is an encounter with the infinite alterity of the self. Matter is an infolding, an involution. It cannot help touching itself. And in the self-touching, it comes in contact with the infinite alterity that it is. Polymorphous perversity raised to an infinite power. Talk about a queer trans intimacy. What is being called into question here is the very nature of the self. And in terms of not just being, but also time. That is in an important self sense, sorry, in an important sense, the self is dispersed, diffracted through time and being. Commenting specifically on the electron self energy interaction, the physicist Richard Feynman, who won a Nobel Prize for his contributions to developing quantum field theory, expressed horror at the electron's monstrous nature and its perverse ways of engaging with the world. Quote, instead of going directly from one point to another, the electron goes along for a while and suddenly emits a photon and then horrors. It absorbs its own photon. Perhaps there's something immoral about that, but the electron does it, unquote. This self-energy, self-touching term has also been labeled a perversion of the theory because the calculation of the self-energy contribution is infinite, which is an unacceptable answer to any question about the nature of the electron, such as its mass or its charge. Apparently touching oneself or being touched by oneself, the ambiguity, undecidability, indeterminacy may itself be the key to the trouble is not simply troubling, but a moral violation, the very source of all the trouble. The problem of self-touching, especially self-touching the other, is a perversity of quantum field theory that goes far deeper than we can touch on here. The gist of it is this, this perversity that is at the root of an unwanted infinity that threatens the very possibility of calculability gets renormalized. Obviously, should we expect anything less? So how does this happen, this renormalization? And by the way, I'm gonna do some scare quotes here. And when I do that, I'm going to be indicating technical terms that physicists use. This is not uh, just uh, my uh, picking words to uh, point out this immorality of self-touching. So anyway, so how does this renormalization happen? Physicists conjecture that there are two different kinds of infinities or perversions involved in this case. One that has to do with self-touching and another that has to do with nakedness. That is, in addition to the infinity related to self-touching, there is an infinity associated with the bare point particle. That is, with the metaphysical assumption we started with that there is only an electron, the undressed bare electron and the void, each separate from the other. Renormalization is the systematic cancellation of infinities, an intervention based on the idea that the subtraction of different sizes in different size infinities can be a finite quantity, perversion, eliminating perversion. The cancellation idea is this, the infinity of the bare point particle cancels the infinity associated with the cloud of virtual particles. 
In this way, the bare point particle is dressed by the vacuum contribution, that is the cloud of virtual particles, the dressed electron, the electron in drag, and that's my riff, that is the physical electron is thereby renormalized, that is made normal, finite. Renormalization is the mathematical handling, taming of these infinities. That is the infinities are subtracted from one another, yielding a finite answer. Mathematically speaking, this is a tour de force. Conceptually, it is a queer theorist delight. It shows that all of matter, matter in its essence, and of course, the notion of essence is precisely what is being troubled here. So matter in its essence is a massive overlaying of perversities, an infinity of infinities. To summarize, the quantum field, theory, quantum field theory radically deconstructs the ontology of classical physics, the starting point ontology of particles in the void, a foundational reductionist essentialism is undone by quantum field theory. According to quantum field theory, perversity and monstrosity lie at the core of being, or rather it is threaded through it. All touching entails an infinite alterity so that touching the other is touching all others, including the self. And touching the self entails touching the stranger within. Even the smallest bits of matter are an unfathomable multitude. Each individual always already includes all possible interactions with itself through all possible virtual others, including those and itself that are non-contemporaneous with itself. That is every finite being is always already threaded through with an infinite alterity diffracted through being and time. Indeterminacy is an undoing, an unslash doing of identity that unsettles the very foundations of non slash being. Electrons, for example, are inherently chimeras, cross species, cross kind mixtures made of virtual configurations, reconfigurings of disparate kinds of beings dispersed across space and time in an undoing of kind, being, becoming, absence, presence, here, there, now, then. So much for natural essence. The electron, a point particle without structure, is a patchwork of kind sutured together in uncanny configurations, trying out each new appendage made of various particle antiparticle pairs, producing and absorbing differences of every possible kind in a radical undoing of kind as essential difference. Its identity is the undoing of identity. Its very nature is unnatural, not given, not fixed, but forever transitioning and transforming itself. Electrons rebirth themselves in their engagement with all others, not as an act of self-birthing, but in an ongoing recreating that is an undoing of itself. Electrons are always already untimely. It is not that electrons sometimes engage in such perverse explorations. These experiments, these wanderings, wanderings, these errant going off track are, um, an, intra, are an interactive transmaterial performativity. This is what an electron is. Ontological indeterminacy, a radical openness, an infinity of possibilities is at the core of mattering. How strange that indeterminacy in its infinite openness is the condition for the possibility of all structures in their dynamically reconfiguring in slash stabilities. Matter in its iterative materialization is a dynamic play of in slash determinacy. Matter is never a settled matter. It is always already radically open. Closure cannot be secured when the conditions of M slash possibilities and lived indeterminacies are integral, not supplementary to what matter is. In an important sense, in a breathtakingly intimate sense, touching, sensing is what matter does, or rather what matter is. Matter is condensations of responses to the desires, desirings to be in touch 
a collective responsiveness, responsivity. Each bit of matter is constituted in response ability. Each is constituted as responsible for the other, as being in touch with the other. Matter is a matter of untimely and uncanny intimacy, condensations of beings and times. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. I really, I, I meet your work with, with joy and with relief. Like it makes me, the way that it makes me feel to think about this and this play of indeterminacies, I am so grateful for. Um, and I'm also so grateful to have a chance for a Q and A now with the audience. So um, as I mentioned before, please, if you, as questions come up to you, chat them directly to Roberto. Um, and we'll start getting to as many of them as possible. And just to get us started, um, I wanted to ask, I feel, or what, what I'm thinking about has to do with writing and more specifically with poetry. Um, I described my experience of first coming to your work in my introduction, and I do feel like it was, it was the ideas that I was being met with that were filling me with this um, excitement, but it was also the way that you were writing it. It was the way that you were using this language. It was the way that I felt that your writing and the words you were, what you were doing with the words that you were selecting um, was mirroring the content that you were describing with this radical openness. And then I also uh, remembered in an earlier version of On Touching, there was this end note where you write, I'm gonna quote you again. Increasingly, I find myself drawn to poetics as a mode of expression, not in order to move away from thinking rigorously, but on the contrary, to move us, and I love that the us is in quotes, towards the possibility of engaging imagination with the, engaging imagination with the force of imagination in its materiality. And I was hoping that you could speak a little more to this relationship between poetry and imagination and materiality and then rigor. And I also wondered if that was in any way connected to thinking about communication in other ways, such as like the vibratory or things that were different from other forms of normative sense. That's a wonderful question. Thank you for that, Laura. Um, so first of all, I would say more than poetry per se, uh, what grabbed me rather than my choosing it was a kind of poetics. That is, I found myself to be part of this field of desiring to express, uh, which is what's very much what's going on with the dynamism of indeterminacy, the dance of indeterminacy that is written into the world. So, um, so not poetry, certainly in the sense of if we mean poetry as a certain kind of form because there's no form substance uh, split uh, or sep separation in a gentle realism. But, uh, but poetics having to do with, um, with expression and the yearning to express, not the yearning of a subject, by the way, um, because the subject doesn't precede the yearning. Um, so, but as you know, co-constituted with that expressivity itself. So, so in particular, uh, you know, part of this is that it doesn't follow the, lo the logics of grammar or language for that matter, or even the kind of, you know, language of the, the kind of grammar of Newtonian thought. Um, because there's, there's a sense of sense-making here that's, you know, very much, um, very much exceeds language. And, and so there's a way in which while I was doing the project of uh, trying to uh, look at quantum mechanics, and by the way, this project that I've been uh, writing about since 2012, which is very much a part of my dissertation uh, in physics, which is quantum field theory is different than quantum mechanics. Mostly when people speak of quantum mechanics, uh, they are quantum physics, they mean quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is just a limit point on a very complex manifold that is quantum field theory. And in fact, it's the limit point where we're only talking about an individual particle going very slow relative to the speed of light 
and that the fields are treated classically, not quantum mechanically themselves. So, so it's a limit case. And while I was doing that, I felt very much like uh, the way I've talked about this is uh, it was kind of like hugging the trunk of the tree. Um, I'd been teaching quantum mechanics for years and trying to work through very much the differences between Bohr and Heisenberg, which took me like a decade to parse through uh, what was going on with that. And then in, you know, <clears throat> one of the things that, um, that I should also emphasize while, while I'm talking about this and trying to express what poetics has to do and imagination and all of that, I haven't lost this strain of your question yet, is uh, the fact that when I'm working with quantum physics and I say quantum field theory, according to quantum field theory, blah, 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 or according to quantum physics, blah, 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 the uh, the quantum the the citation there of quantum physics or quantum mechanics or quantum physics has to do with my um, feminist political decolonial reading of quantum mechanics or quantum field theory. In other words, I'm not just giving it over in the way the theory is. Part of what's in chapter seven of Meeting the Universe halfway. Well, not part of, but is a new interpretation of quantum physics. So that I've read the critical political theory and social theories that I've been uh, you know, trying to digest and to learn. And I take those insights and read them back into the physics. And so I just wanted to emphasize that. Anyway, it was a different project trying to give over what I was doing with quantum mechanics than quantum field theory. There's very little uh, work on trying to express quantum field theory. And I felt much more like I was out in the feathery part of the tree of the branches and the really feathery parts there. And uh, what I've talked about is like, as if I'm, uh, you know, like an inchworm dangling over the void on a piece, a thin piece of silk. That's, that's the way it feels like to me. And, and feeling and having this bodily felt sense of trying to give over what I feel about it is very much a part of the work for me and working with the theory because the theory to me is, theories are material. They're not like thought bubbles over your head. They're, you know, so working with the materiality of the theory, much like I am doing an experiment or something, I can literally feel it in my body what I'm trying to give over. So that's the sense in which I, can sense the sense of touching. Like what is the sense making that's going on here in terms of the void and how do I sense that and put that sense of touching in touch with uh, the theory and what I'm trying to do with it. So, so it's really a matter of uh, trying to, to negotiate all that and work with the theory. I just also wanted to speak to your point about radical openness. Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful uh, compliment, but I'm not sure I can accept it. Um, in, in a sense, right, in a sense, there's a kind of paradox in succeeding at radical openness. Uh, there's a yearning towards it, right, to be in touch with radical openness. And I feel like, you know, the best that I can do is to make an attempt to escape from the usual sense of sense making as capture or as graspable, right? So uh, according to indeterminacy, you know, the radical opening and openness and reopening that is the nothingness in its materiality is this dance of indeterminacy, which completely undermines graspability and containment. So, uh, so it's, it's it's a different kind of project of sense making in that sense. I hope I haven't gone on too long so that now we can't uh, want to hear other questions as well. But it was such a delicious question. So thank you. No, that was such a delicious answer. Thank you. And I did, I, I felt that inchworm over the void is a very beautiful way to think about poetry, I feel. Um, and we're getting a lot of really wonderful questions from the audience as well. So let me... We have a question coming up from Kuvar S. Kuvar, I'm asking you to unmute now, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Hello. Yes, you pronounced it right. 
Hi, so I, um, first Hi. of all, thank you so much for giving such a beautiful talk. Um, I kind of want to ask my question, the second part first, because the second part is more personal um, to my own experience of your work, which is just a statement of appreciation that reading your work and your engagement has really helped me. It's sort of provided me the grammar or the anti-grammar through which I can express, best express my own transness as both genderless and containing all iterations I've been. So first and foremost, I do want to thank you for providing language in a world in which epistemic violence is rife and we're always sort of trying to grasp for the best, uh, the best words to approximate our experiences. Thank you. Um, and my question, it, sort of coming off of that, is thinking about the transpoetic possibilities of electrons, um, how numerous they are. How has um, understanding this influenced your own perspective on queerness, on sex, on gender? Um, your own, both your own lived experience of it, your understanding of its performance, um, and potentially your modes of doing or being with it. Mm. Yeah, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I think what in some ways what it's given me a deeper appreciation of is the sense of the, the way in which our felt sense is always a reaching towards, or at least I, I can speak personally in terms of that. So for example, uh, you know, I use they, them pronouns, I identify as non-binary. That's not an identity that I would have uh, taken on some years ago because it wasn't something that uh, existed in a certain sense. In some other sense, of course, it did exist. So there's that existence, non-existence play of things. And the, the you know, this, the, you know, the question of the demands of for whom do we have to express this also is a question that gets raised as well. Uh, you know, what is this desire for somebody to speak their identity and who needs to know? And, uh, and but also the ways in which there's, to allow the non-contemporaneity of different ways of expressing gender that, um, you know, open it up because trans here in a sense, in the interactive sense also isn't a going from point A to point B because the this and the that uh, don't precede their interaction but are constituted through it. And so that opens up an entire multiplicity of possibilities for different kinds of expressings and, uh, you know, a whole plethora of, of this, a, a kind of, uh, the void is far from always exuberance, but there's a kind of exuberance that I think that is really politically important here, especially, you know, perhaps especially now, but always already, uh, always having been that kind of need for many people. So, yeah, so I would say that the kind of openness, that radical openness that Laura was alluding to that gives us uh, possibilities for being in touch with ourselves and with others in very different kinds of ways. So thank you, Kavar, is it Kavar? It's an awesome name, it means all already, right? Can't hear. Oh, yes, hi, I'm unmuted. Uh -huh. um, Kavar is actually, um, well, it was initially my, my last name, my family name that I now use as my, as my given name. Um, I have no idea what it means, but I'm certainly awesome. happy to take that meaning on. <laughs> okay. Great. And I greatly appreciate your answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kavar. Thank you, Karen. That was really exciting to, to hear and listen to. I have a question from Daisy Atterbury in the audience. I'm gonna read it on Daisy's behalf. Um, Daisy writes, you mentioned that the void is a useful tool for colonialism and said you might be willing to speak more to that. I wondered too, do you consider a will to cohere to be associated with coloniality? Mm. Thank you, Daisy. 
So yeah, thank you, Daisy. I, I take it that that was an invitation both to speak to the question of coherence and also about the void and coloniality. Um, so one of the things that Newtonian physics gives us in uh, making this sharp distinction between matter and the void is the void is literally that which doesn't matter. And I think that this has been a useful and brutal tool of colonialism, especially when we think of, you know, terra nullius and other ways of, uh, you know, convenient ways for uh, settlers to come to a place and saying, there's no labor being done, there's no property, there's nothing here, we're the first ones, we put down our flag and claim this property. And, um, you know, I've written quite a bit about the void, especially now with regard to nuclear colonialisms. And that's because, you know, there's nothing like purely liberatory about quantum field theory. It's deeply connected with military, industrial, and colonialist, imperialist and, uh, projects of uh, making the atom bomb. And so I've been, have, papers called Troubling Times and After the End of the World and so on, other writings where I'm trying to address um, uh, questions of, of nuclear colonialism in particular uh, as part of my own uh, responsibility uh, as a physicist. Um, and the thing here is of course that the void is not the, the Newtonian notion of nothing. It is not an absence, it is not a lack. Uh, there is a way in which uh, a kinds of avoidance and erasure and devaluation that usually goes with nothing uh, is being completely reworked here. Uh, I noticed that you have uh, Norbessi Philip uh, coming up and she's amazing. And you know, the poem Zong to me is just this extraordinary, uh, uh, just incredibly powerful way of speaking that which can't be spoken. To me, this is very much like, um, you know, I feel a lot of resonance with the project here. You know, what about the voids that are created by the atom bombs? that were blasted into uh, the Marshall Islands and the atolls, including the blasting away and the disintegration of four atolls. Um, and so what does it mean to make that kind of void and then to try to cover it up as a kind of avoidance? So the, there are lots of questions here, I think that have to do with um, a certain kind of uh, undoing of uh, Newtonian physics and its inheritances that I, that is very much a part of my project. Um, yeah, the will to cohere, I think, um, just to come back to Daisy's question about that. Yeah, I think the question of cohering um, is a really important one. <clears throat> and it feels like it relates also in a certain kind of way to Kavar's previous question. Um, uh, you know, for, for whom does it have to be coherent and in what kinds of ways? And I guess, you know, again, this speaking silence of the void of, you know, a kind of collective uh, uh, rejection and escape of those kinds of colonialist desires to make things fall in line according to certain notions of law and order is very much uh, part of what's threaded through uh, the materiality of the world and available for us in terms of a force of justice. So thanks for the question, Daisy. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Karen. That there's so much to think about and learn there. Um, the next person we have a really great question from who will be on camera is Sarah Jane Stoner. I am unmuting you now. Hi. Hello, thank you so much for this. It was so wonderful. I mean, my mind has been blown since 2018 at Barnard. I, my idea of the void um, was just completely uh, revolutionized in ways that have had immediate effects on myself as well. So um, I'm feeling 
along with Kavar, the resonance um, in relation to my own self. I, I have so many questions. Um, I fantasize about running into you at a bar and having you for several hours often, but I'm gonna ask just one in the interest of time. Um, okay, what kinds of shared time are possible through the kind of alterity um, a self discovers through that self touching that it does. So I'll say it again, what kinds of shared time are possible through the kind of alterity that the self discovers through its own self touching? Can you say a little bit more about what you mean by shared time and what's maybe even what's at stake for you in the question so that, um, so that I can help answer it? Yes. I think I think it has to do with like the the like what feels like an initial kind of proposal for um an I mean an ethics in um in the in the discovery of this of this very fundamental alterity and um and then the possibility of a sociality growing out of that ethics and for some reason I think it's probably my experience with you at Barnard makes me want to phrase the question in terms of time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So I would say that one of the things that the way in terms of that I think of it in terms of the questions of, of the points about sociality and ethics here with regard to alterity is that something that's really important is the troubling of time. And so the question is, um, what time is it and for whom? And this notion, once again, a, a kind of Newtonian notion of time as being a parameter that just marches along almost like an assembly line of moments. Uh, because every moment is identical according to this conception of time that is completely independent of everything and anything that's happening. Uh, this kind of conception of time is uh, doesn't hold with Newtonian with uh, quantum physics um, so that there can be an entanglement, for example, of different times. So I, I, both in the paper that I think that I gave at Barnard on troubling times, I'm playing with ways in which, you know, it allows for the entanglement of times and other kinds of ways in which time and, and its indeterminacy uh, becomes available to us in different ways that we rework the possibilities of reworking space, time, and matter are very, very um, important. Those potentialities and those imaginings, mm -hmm. imaginings are material. And so, and they're available in the thick now. So I think, uh, you know, at least resonantly with Walter Benjamin in terms of Yetzite. So there's this sense in which, you know, that Temporality doesn't simply go along, but that we can uh, do things like with the quantum eraser, for example, where it's not a matter of erasing some violence that happens in the past. That's not possible, that kind of erasure. But it is possible to rework the temporalities that have to do with the kind of ethical and political way of talking about you know, reparations or restorative justice or whether other kinds of actions which have to do with the fact that the past isn't past. Mm -hmm. It never is. And the future is not out in front such that we don't know, you know such as, as if there's an uncertainty about the future that people keep talking about at this time. But it's not merely that the future is uncertain uh, there isn't some future that already exists that we don't know. It's that it's ontological indeterminacy in the sense of the fact that there is no future out in front and it certainly hasn't already happened. And so the, the ways in which, uh, you know, to be taking full advantage of that in working collectively with this kind of notion of what's available in the thick now, I think puts us in a very different position, a more empowered position than sitting here feeling the a kind of passive conception of the uncertainty of the future. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that quite gets at your question, but the question of temporality, 
I, the question of shared is a little is a little difficult, and you know we could work on that at the bar sometime over a drink. Great, I'll hit you okay. up soon. I think the thick now will help me on my way. I appreciate okay. it. Okay, yeah, I have a paper called uh, "What Flashes Up," where I talk about uh, Walter Benjamin's work. I put the quantum field theory in relation to Walter Benjamin. Great, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I have to admit that was a little a meeting of two of my favorite thinkers and writers. So that was a real, a real pleasure for me. Um, I want to check in, Karen, how are you feeling? Want to do one more question, two more questions? What more than that as you prefer? Um, why don't we see how it goes? But thanks for checking in about that. I'm sure we all have Zoom fatigue. I know I'm trying to be with, every, yeah. with everybody to see about hanging in there. But I think I could do at least at least another one. Okay, cool. Great. Wonderful. We're still getting lots of really, really great questions from the audience. I see another person with a question on camera, Michael Goldman. One second, Michael, let me. Hi. So, uh, okay. Okay, great. Um, so I was intrigued by what you said about um, particles dying into the void. I, I, I see this relation, this relationship between the void and particles. And I'm wondering if you could just say a few words about particles dying into and also maybe being born out of the void and just the relationship of uh, how things are created and die and yet seem kind of stable at the same time. Yeah, I think, thanks for the question, Michael. Um, yeah, I think that one of the most uh, surprising things perhaps is that the indeterminacy that, we've, that I've been talking about is actually at the root for anything like stability, which of course I'm pointing out here is always transient. We we're just talking about Walter Benjamin and that's extremely important for him that the nature of nature is one of transients that institutions of fascism and violence uh, won't last forever. And the question is, you know, how to enact certain kinds of politics to bring the end more quickly. So, uh, so the question of, you know, some people have wondered uh, what this indeterminacy then has to do in relationship to, um, you know, actual stuffness in the world barriers, fences, cages that children are being put into, ways and in those kinds of things, mountain ranges. Uh, and so, you know, it's about the iterativity of this interaction, as I've been talking about it, can help to stabilize certain kinds of structures, but also they can be destabilized so that there isn't a, a kind of, you know, living eternally that was built into a classical physics conception of the atom, the atom supposedly the uncuttable going back to the Greeks, atomos, and a way in which these were the eternal beings uh, that exist for all time. And even the atom itself is not only not uncuttable, but is also, um, it, but also doesn't have uh, a, a lifetime that goes on forever. In fact, and for particles, we talk in terms of half-lives, which is an interesting concept to think about who gets apportioned something like a half-life. And we're thinking here about anti-blackness and other kinds of forms of violence about, about having a whole life, but um, premature death as Ruthie Gilmore talks about uh, racism. So I, I think that these, you know, the, the question, these questions of transitoriness with regard to um, indeterminacy are, are very important and very poignant politically. Not sure if that gets, does that get at your question or? Well, that, that's definitely part of it. Uh, I also just look at uh, like, you know, you talk about material things like mountains and I, I get the sense from what you're saying is that they're continually uh, being recreated like every moment. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're being recreated every moment. And some, some of that recreation at every moment really helps stabilize some, something. 
-hmm. but it's not it's not about eternity anymore, which is a very different ontology and a very different metaphysics than the kinds of stories that we're used to hearing about the nature of matter itself. Of course, 20th century physics destabilizes it in several kinds of ways because matter can turn into energy. That's E equals MC squared. So, uh, which is part of what's happening with the vacuum there. So, so again, this transitoriness, I think, is, is really, uh, really, really important when we're talking about the kind of life force built into the vacuum of kind of yearning and desire for beingness uh, that, you know, may or may not come to be. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Michael. We have another question um, from the audience that I will read on their behalf. This is Daniela Molnar, who asks first a little question. Is the image on the title slide a Sonia Delaunay painting? Uh, and I'm curious to hear Karen talk about the relationship of these ideas to queer ecology. Is the image on the cover the image from the book? Yes, it is. And it's a picture by Don Maison is the author's, is the artist's name. I love, I love this image. This image is actually uh, not of entanglement. I'm, I have to admit that I've forgotten exactly how she entitles it, but she does a lot of different physics art. But to me, this, you know, was, and it was, it's almost, you know, the particle physics version of the Michelangelo thing, uh, a kind of different kind of touching. Uh, so anyway, yes, with credit to Don Maison for her remarkable um, artistry. So uh, in terms of queer ecologies, there, I mean, that's an enormous topic and we have something a little bit more uh, concrete about that or more specific. Danielle, are you ready to be on okay, okay, hi. Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you, Karen. I, I think my question has to do with the implications of your ideas for ecological thinking. Um, like if a mountain is always being recreated, does that encompass mining the mountain? <laughs> does that encompass building a road? Um, you know, to, to give vehicular access to the mountain? Like where, where does the creation, destruction, recreation, and this, um, this sort of um, um, life force that you've been referencing in various ways that exists both in the void and in matter, like what implications does that have for um, queer ecological thought? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that it, has to do with uh, those kinds of questions. Well, when I think about extractivist uh, capitalism and you know the ways in which colonization is operates through extractivism uh, at times, uh, and and the the point here, I think um, I, I can tell I'm getting tired all of a sudden, but the point here has to do again with these kinds of ways of rethinking both what we think that we know what the nouns mean, mountain, uh, uh, digging holes and so on and so forth, but also relationality. If we think in terms of relationality, I think we're gonna come up with different, very different kinds of questions. And of course there are the questions here uh, then in terms of violence, uh, in terms of certain kinds of forms of violence and, their, and the need to redress them. Uh, and if, you know, if we think about the very way in which matter is constituted, so that matter is always already an alterity, it gives us, a, it's an undoing of a certain kind of notion of othering, capital O, othering. Uh, if the other is always already uh, something that uh, helps constitute the self and the self is being undone here in the usual conventional notion of self, might that call for a different kind of ethics, a different way of relating, a different kind of politics, 
So these, you know, it's really not in a certain kind of way to provide general answers so much as an invitation to ask different kinds of questions in thinking and thinking with this. So, uh, so there's a lot more to say about that. And what I always tell my students is, uh, let's sit and think with a particular, give me a particular site where extractivism is happening and let's look and trace all the various entanglements that are at play. What are the various apparatuses of bodily production that are helping to constitute the things that we take to be nouns? How have those things been sedimented, sedimented through what kinds of practices and so on? So it's really an invitation to, to, to you know, to uh, dig underneath extractivism in, cer in certain kinds of ways to rethink things, but it has to be done in the specificity of the site and not uh, that somehow there's some kind of answer that can be done in cookie cutter fashion. I'm not saying your question, Daniela, suggests that. I'm just saying that, you know, the specificity is something that's very, very important, I think, in terms of working through these things. And it will uh, require a collective effort. It can't be done by one person. It has to be, you know, there's just too many uh, various entanglements to trace as, as one person. And if the question, if, if there aren't, you know, kind of the, the foundations of of the usual ways in which questions are being asked, if the underlying assumptions aren't being troubled, it's probably not going deep enough. Uh, so just to, you know, sorry to keep using the, the metaphor of digging, but, but I think metaphors, as, as my postdoc Daniela Gandarfer talks about them as metaphorical, and understanding them as metaphorical is hugely important in this case. Uh, so really working through the specificities of all of it. So thank you so much. And, and I, think, I think, Laura, I'm a little bit Zoom cooked. All right. So, uh, so maybe uh, it's, yeah. it's time to, to wrap things up. So. This is, you've, I mean, you've left us with so much. And now, preciously, with what matter for a call, I'll, that is incredible. I'm very excited to hear more thinking from this person. Um, Thank you there so much. There will be a special issue of theory event coming and theory and event coming out about it. So oh, great news. All right. Well, well, we'll share that with the group after this. But thank you so much, Karen. This has been thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody who's shown up. And thank you so much, Laura, for hosting and all the hard work that you've done putting this together twice. And it's it's, it's been really wonderful to interact with you. No, it's been a really seamless great. joy for me. So thank you. And thank you all so much for being here tonight. We'll see you. There's another really great reading at the Poetry Project on Monday. On Monday, uh, Joselia, Rebecca Hughes, and Jimena Lucero would love to see you there for that. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Karen. Have a Thanks. wonderful evening. You too. Bye bye. Bye.